Yeah. Okay, so I want to thank you all for coming out this afternoon. I want to apologize for um, my... problems with my computer so um i i'm not able to share my screen and i my camera is not working so i still have some problems sorting out but we'll still go through um what i've prepared for this evening and once i get that sorted out i can always revisit the slides and we'll go through it okay all right anyone there Yes, we are here. All right. Okay. okay. So again, I do apologize. Yes, I do apologize. But hopefully we could still have the discussion going and we'll have all the visual um, by next week. Please, the Lord. And we stopped at verse 16. Anyone remember what we discussed in verse 16? But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will. And none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. And of course, we, we look at um, the one that shall do according to his own Rome. Rome does what she wants. However, Rome worked through a particular general, and that general led the charge of Rome. And he did what he wanted. Anyone remember that general's name? He's one of Rome's most famous generals. I don't know if you're saying something, Sister Ennis, but they're very soft. Anyone remember that the general, that general's name starts with P? Um, P. Pompey, very good. That's correct. Pompey, yes. And Pompey was a very forceful general. He was a good general. And, you know, he was known for his resourcefulness, his tactical ability, and his commanding presence. And he was then later on dubbed Pompey the Great. So he, he did a lot to expand the Republic of Rome. He did, he did much in subduing the pirates that occupied the Mediterranean because that would have weakened Rome's crossing of the, the Mediterranean as well. So he dealt with the pirates. Anybody remember what he did to the pirates? It was very amusing. Anyone remember? Work on he put them yes. To work. He turned them into farmers. Very good, Sister Uma. He turned them into farmers. I found that to be very amusing, right? But he, he, he also settled the quarrels that they had in Spain and many other places across Europe as well. So to a large extent, he was very successful and he earned a very big name and title for himself as he expanded the Roman Republic. Now, when we go to verse, and, and also we look at the fact that when it said that he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. And we saw that Judea and Jerusalem were under the, the rulership of the Alexander family. And Alex, uh, the king at the time had two sons. Now he died and his wife, Alexandra, wanted the eldest son, Hyrcanus, to become the priest king of that Judean state, right? Judean and Jerusalem as well. But his younger brother, uh, Aristobulus, I don't know if you remember him, he was very ambitious, very aggressive. And so knowing his mother's wishes, he, under, he, he, he ignored that and undermined his brother. And he proved to be um, more than a match for Hyrcanus, and he took over, and he assumed rulership. But of course, there was a lot of back and forth. We wouldn't go into much detail because um, I believe we can look at the videos again. We just did a slight recap, 
And so this, this quarrel back and forth between the brothers um, came, started to escalate. And of course, by then, Pompey sweeping across Europe and then coming down south to conquer Syria, uh, uh, Sicilia, most of the Seleucid Empire came into the Judean and Jerusalem area. And on his arrival, the brothers sought to win his audience. So whoever they felt, whoever could convince Pompey would be able to rule. And so they both set, a, a set in motion things to woo Pompey. Now, Aristobulus was most successful. His gift was most extravagant to win Pompey. But you see, the Romans were very sneaky and cheeky. You see, while Aristobulus would have won the Romans by his, his um, assertiveness and his gifts, the Romans felt that he was a little too forward and would have made him harder to control, while Canus was a little more subservient and not as aggressive. So they felt that he would be better able, they were better able to control him. So at first, it looked like the Romans preferred Aristobulus, but eventually they, they promoted Hyrcanus, and Aristobulus became a prisoner of Rome eventually. So just recapping again, um, some of Aristobulus' followers decided that they're not going to give up, and they decided to, to hold the fort and to fight. Of course, Pompey quell, quenched that riot quite easily, and... In doing so, he, he, he then placed Judah, Judea, and Jerusalem under Roman rule. So it was under Pompey that the, Jew, the, Jew, the, Jew, the Jewish system became subjected to the Roman system. So they lost their independence. And never again would they regain their independence. So they would have been allowed to have to maintain the priestly system and some form of civil government. And I said some form because even though they had a civil government or a civil, I shouldn't say government, because I don't want it to sound too much like a hierarchy, because Rome ultimately had power, but they had a civil leadership. However, any type of capital punishment that had to be administered because of their uh, their judi of their because of their judiciary, they still had to go to Rome for permission. So they still can execute judgment as they like. They still had to go to Rome. So so we see from verse sixteen that Pompey, representing Rome, did as he pleased. And he swept across Europe, swept across Asia Minor. We know Asia Minor is like where Bulgaria is, Turkey. I remember we looked at those maps. And coming down south to Syria, Sicilia, Judea, Jerusalem. Um, that, that area there today is where we would call modern day Iraq, Iran, Jordan, Israel, Palestine. That whole area there. He would have, Pompey would have been coming down that area there and so he in verse 6 or verse 16 we ended by looking at Pompey and all that he was able to do and his conquest of Judea and Jerusalem bringing them under Roman rule so they were no longer independent or allowed to make any executive decisions per se they still needed the blessings of Rome to carry out some of their um judicial um, exec executions, right? So that, that was verse 16. Anyone had any questions or anything that, that troubled them in any regard to, you know, what we would have discussed last time we were here? Anyone remember anything they would like to share, you know, before we jump on to verse 17? All right, well, as always, feel free, you know, to share or comment, feel free to um, ask a question. Um, if I don't know the answer, I will, I will say I don't know, but I would not leave it at that. I would do my best to um, do a little more research and come up with a, an answer to, for the question there, based on the research.
All right. So if, if no one has any questions or comments, we will go on to verse 17, right? Now, verse 17 could be a little confusing because it starts by saying, and we read verse 17, he shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of woman, corrupting her, but she shall not stand on his side, neither be for him. Now, between verse 16 and verse 17, there, there is an abrupt end and an abrupt start. Because verse 17 does not continue the reign of Pompey, nor does it show how Pompey ended his uh, generalship. But it jumps to the next prominent Roman general, which is Julius Caesar. So between verse 16 and 17, there's a jump from Pompey to Julius Caesar. And so there is no, um, it, it doesn't show a clear transition, transition as to what happened to Pompey and how Julius Caesar came into prominence. So what I will do is just try to fill in the gap, but keeping in line with where the text is going so that we don't lose the focus. But just to help you transition between that text, because it says he also shall set his face, that he is Julius Caesar. And to set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom. So the his there is referring to the Alexandrian kingdom of Egypt. It's referring there. Now, that sounds kind of confusing. And how did we get at that? How did we arrive at that? And that's why I said there's a little, uh, there's some history in between that will make it a little easier because the jump might be hard to follow. So I'll just, I'll just share what it is. And then we will go back and look at it step by step and see if we could trace it to see how the Bible progressed from verse 16 to 17. So 17, the he that starts off with there, it's Julius Caesar. He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his kingdom. Now, although the word there uses with in the original Hebrew, it really means against. So the text should read, he shall also set his face to enter against the strength of his whole kingdom. The his there is the Alexandrian kingdom, which was ruled by the Ptolemies. That's Egypt. And he was the, he is the last of the, the, Hellenistic generals to rule. Because remember, we saw that Seleucid fell under Pompey. And the only general, the only Hellenistic, and by the word Hellenistic, it means Greek, or the only Greek general still standing, or, or the Greek ruler still standing is Ptolemy. So that is the last Alexandrian kingdom or part of the Alexandrian empire that is still standing that has to fall under Roman rule. So verse 17 is telling us that Julius Caesar is going to enter against the strength of the whole of the Ptolemaic empire. And there are going to be some upright ones with him who will help him in this conquest. Now, what the he here again re re refers to the Alexandrian, uh, the Alexandrian ruler or monarch. So he shall stand, sorry, he shall give him the daughters of women, corrupting her, but she shall not stand in the side, neither be for him. So when Caesar entered into Egypt, there was a very beautiful woman who made herself available to him. And it caused Caesar to be distracted somewhat because of her beauty. But in the end, what happened is she betrayed Caesar and she then became a lover or a consort of one of his enemies. So the text there is around Julius Caesar. So I'll just go very briefly and then we'll jump back in time and see how we arrived at there at that point. So verse 17 says, he also, he, Julius Caesar, shall set a space to enter against the strength of the Ptolemaic empire 
and some upright ones will help him do that. But Ptolemy will try to give him a, a woman that would distract him and, and, and kind of throw him off his course. And it did, but what happened is she betrayed him in the end. So it says, but she shall not stand on his side, neither shall she be for him. So she betrayed him. So we will see how we jump from verse 16 to verse 17. All right? So I hope that by the time we come back to 17, it would make a little more sense. And as always, if anything is confusing, feel free to ask, please. I have no problem going over or repeating because we're not here to speed through, but to understand, all right? So let's go back to verse 16. Pompey is doing something. He, he, is, he, is, he, is, he has risen to become one of Rome's not only most famous general, but a very able and powerful general, okay? And so he is poised to, and he's also consul at that point in time. Remember, we saw that that was the form of rulership or leadership developed within the Roman Republic when they moved from a monarchical system to becoming a republic. And as we discuss, a republic means for the people. But we recognize that most republics are never for the people, but for those in power. Right? So for those in power. So I'm going to give you um, a brief overview of Pompey and what happened to him. But we, as I said, we're, going to, we're keeping it tight because the history is vast. We're keeping it tight so we stay on track. So I'm going to just cover the parts of history that shows the fall of Pompey and how Pompey fell and how Julius Caesar rose into prominence. So while Pom so Pompey, Pompey, Rome had broken down considerably in terms of its civil order. There were a lot of uprisings. There, there were a lot of gangs raised up and, and everyone seemed to be seeking his own interests. And the Senate seemed to be powerless to control these uprisings within the Republic. Now, Pompey was a consul. Of course, he would have had an army under his command. And what the Senate would do is the Senate, when they would have had an enemy, whether local or abroad, they would then give the consul the approval to engage in a war so that the consuls would use the army based on the dictates of the Senate. But as we look at that construct, we realize that it was doomed to fail because if the consul himself had control of such a vast army and the, the politicians or the senators were just a couple of men giving orders, it was, there would be a point in time when the consul would come to some kind of realization. If I have an army, maybe I could use it to force the Senate to make the decision that I want. So that started to, that was the thought behind the consuls at the time. And when this uprising and this unsettlement started to take place in the Roman Republic, the consuls decided that they could what the Senate couldn't do by their word, they could do it by the force of arms. So in this regard, we have three men that stood out and they came together to bring the chaotic and the political violence of Rome into check. And they, these were three men. One was Pompey. The next one, was Crassus. Now, Crassus was believed to be one of the richest men in Rome. He was believed to be one of the richest men in Rome. So they came together. Now, this was a secret alliance. The Senate never approved this. But remember, the consuls had the army. Crassus had money. So he could have afforded to pay the soldiers who in turn would have done whatever their general required without putting Rome first. They put money before Rome. So they were 
guns for hire, so to speak. So it was easy to control these soldiers and easy to push your agenda as a consul. So we had Pompey coming together with Crassus. Now, both Pompey and Crassus realized that there was a, a new up and coming figure who was not only popular among the senators or the patricians, but he was also popular among the common people. And that man was Julius Caesar. Now, Julius Caesar came from a noble family, but he had a very, very keen military mind. He was also a great orator. He could talk. He was charismatic and he had the, the, the love of the people, the common people. And his popularity grew. Not only that, his military prowess also grew. So Caesar and Pompey decided that if their plan must work, they must be able to convince Julius Caesar to join them. So this they set about to do. And they were able to convince Julius Caesar to join them. So modern historians call this the first triumvirate. Now, that is not an ancient term. It's a modern term given to this triple alliance. In other words, when they came together, they did not call themselves a triumvirate. But historians afterwards, looking at how they operated, they give the name the, a triumvirate. So that's what modern historians call it, a triumvirate. So it was Caesar, Crassus, who was considered to be the richest man or the wealthiest man in Rome, and Julius Caesar, another powerful military general, right? So we have these three coming together, but remember, brethren, this is secretly. They are not doing this by the word or by the authority of the Senate. They are doing this behind the scene. So this triumvirate does have its own political agenda. So, so money, the, so, the, so wait, brother Wade, mm -hmm. money always talks. Nothing money new under all, the sun. Nothing new under the sun. Money always talks. And so you would realize that this trio was a very powerful trio. They had the muscle of arms and they had the money. So it was, you realize that the Senate now became a puppet. And so their ambitions were pursued. So whereas the Senate would have to approve the, a, a consul to go to a war, a consul would decide this is the war he'd want to fight. And he'd tell the Senate, I'm going to fight. So you all need to approve this. And that's what happened. So it was very, very, it was a very ambitious and a very powerful triumvirate. Caesar, Pompey and Crassus, and they were very, very um, potent in, in seeing their interests go through. Now, Julius Caesar benefited from this triumvirate extremely. You see, he had a lot of debts he would have incurred in his, his, his battles. That is one. Two, it allowed Julius Caesar to become a consul so that he, it, it, it lifted him now to even a higher state. So he benefited the most from the triumvirate. And imagine this success added to his already growing popularity and prowess as a military mind. So it did him a world of good. Now, what also helped Caesar to grow in prominence was, remember, this triumvirate did not take orders directly from the Senate. They used their power to influence the Senate. So, the war, so Julius Caesar now had the opportunity to fight the wars that was profitable to him. And one of the wars he fought was the, the, the wars of Gaul. He went to conquer Gaul. Now, Gaul is what is now France and Belgium. That was Gaul, and also some of the Germanic tribes. And what, what that did was it allowed him to extend his influence, and it gave him more military prowess. 
because he conquered all of that area. Now hear this, after his invasion of Gaul, he read, he went on to Britain. And what happened was his invasion of Gaul and Britain amassed a certain amount of wealth. So he now became not only rich, but he also became very, a very powerful general. And remember that at this point, he is a consul. So he has under his command a couple legions, at least four legions of soldiers underneath his command. Now, with, with, with Julius Caesar growing ever so much and expanding ever so much, we must that the other members of the triumvirate would get suspicious of his ambitions. Because remember the triumph on the decline. Pompey is now on the decline. Julius Caesar is on the rise. And what makes this particular invasion of Gaul and Britain even more suspicious to the other members of the triumvirate is that the Senate told Julius Caesar to disband his army and to come back to Rome. Julius Caesar refused to disband his army. But here what he did, he marched on Rome. So it was an aggressive, aggressive step by Caesar to march on Rome. Of course, he would um, later on state that because of fear for his life, you know, he did it as an act of self-defense. So it was, he said it was, in his opinion, or to justify it, it wasn't nothing, um, it wasn't insinuating anything negative. He knew that they were jealous of him and there were men who were looking to take his life. So he marched with his army just as to keep to make sure that he was secure and also to keep his supporters secure. Now, now brethren, do you think that Pompey and Crassus and the Senate would feel so comfortable by such an explanation? Brethren, what are your thoughts? Do you think the Senate felt comfortable that Caesar marched on Rome with his army just as a form of self-defense? Do you think that made them feel comfortable and they slept peacefully at night? What are your thoughts? Yes, no? No. Right, no, I heard no, anyone else? What are your thoughts? And no one else has any thoughts, anyone? Just share your thoughts. Do you think that the Senate and the other members of the triumvirate bought Caesar's uh, excuse of aggressively coming to Rome with his army? Just like to get some feedback? Mm. Right. Probably yes. They bought it. All right. Some said yes, some said no. Well, this is what happened. When Caesar came to Rome, he did in fact have many enemies because by that time he became the most powerful man in Rome. Yeah. Now, Pompey, Pompey and some of the senators decided that Julius Caesar had gotten too big, too fast, and too powerful, and that it would be it 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 would not be a good idea to turn a blind eye to what he just did. So, what took place next was a civil war. What took place next was a civil war. Now, when the civil war broke, it would have been Pompey. Yes, it would have been Pompey 
who would have led his forces and his supporters and his sympathizers against Julius Caesar. No, with that battle, Caesar was outnumbered and Pompey was a great general. You see, Pompey understood that Julius Caesar had the experience. His soldiers were battle hardened. So he had prepared, he had prepared for on for a, a head-on battle. That battle took place in Greece. Now Caesar was outnumbered, and of course, Pompey was an experienced general. However, the unthinkable happened. Julius Caesar smashed Pompey's army. However, that did not end the civil war just yet. It didn't end the civil war just yet. What happened was that Julius Caesar then returned to Rome because the triumvirate has now been destroyed. Crassus cannot, he doesn't have the military right, he has the money. The military arm he would have leaned upon would have been Pompey. But Pompey at this time was, his forces were obliterated by Julius Caesar. So Julius Caesar now has the opportunity to move into Rome. So when Julius Caesar moved into Rome, he declared himself a dictator. So let me explain quickly what a dictator is. Now, when we say dictator in our days here, in our context, it would normally be a bad thing. But when in back in the day, if there was a single threat to Rome that was unavoidable and it, it looked imminent, the consuls would give up their control to one man known as the dictator. The dictator only held that power for six months and the Senate would then either um, allow him to continue further if they saw fit or they would then relieve the authority from him and the consuls would then function as normal. So the dictator was a temporary position created to take on a threat to the Republic. So Julius Caesar made himself dictator. In other words, he was supposed to be the champion of the Senate or of Rome, and that is Republic Rome. But here the thing with Julius Caesar, Julius Caesar wanted to be a perpetual dictator. In other words, when he declared himself dictator, he had no intention to give it up. Now, what that did was it destroyed the framework of Rome as a republic. So he became the sole ruler of the Roman Republic. But remember, the Republic was for the people, and it was supposed to be governed by the Senate. But when he became dictator, it means one man had absolute control. So effectively, when he did that, it spelled the end for the Roman Republic, and it, it opened up the door for the Roman Empire. So he was the Roman, so he was the total ruler now of Rome. Now, we still have Pompey on the loose. Now, Julius Caesar can't afford to have Pompey on the loose because Pompey is still a formidable opponent. And if his leadership or his rulership of the Roman Republic must be fully established, he must put down anyone that could threaten his rulership. So he cannot allow Pompey to preserve his army and his position as a consul. So what he then decided to do was to go after Pompey. Now, while Julius Caesar went after Pompey, he left someone in control of Rome and Italy. That person is known as Mark Antony, another popular name I'm sure we would have heard. So Mark Antony was in charge of Roman Italy while Julius Caesar went behind Pompey. Now, Pompey fled to Egypt. Now, why did Pompey flee to Egypt? 
All right, this is why. Ptolemy or Letis, that was, that was a pharaoh in Egypt when he, he, he had two young children, Ptolemy and Cleopatra. They were very young and it was his intent that Ptolemy and Cleopatra, brother and sister, should marry one another and rule the kingdom together. So he died with, he died with that um, expectation of both of them. Also, because they were young, they were placed under the guardianship of Rome. And guess who was their guardian? It was Pompey. Pompey was the guardian of Orletti's two children who were supposed to succeed him, which was Ptolemy and Cleopatra. When Ptolemy Oletis died, Pompey became the guardian of these youngsters who were on the throne to look over them, to watch over them, and to groom them. So he was the guardian elected by the Senate to watch over them. So now that he is running from Julius Caesar, he have an ally down in Egypt. So he fled naturally down to Egypt where he could easily reinforce himself. He could easily get the resources needed and he could easily sway the monarchs on the throne because he was their guardian. And so he made decisions in their best interests. Here lies the problem. When Pompey went to Egypt to hide, he was betrayed by Ptolemy and he was murdered. So that's how Pompey died. He was murdered in Egypt, betrayed by Ptolemy, the one who is supposed to be guardian over. While he was running, he was betrayed by Ptolemy and he died running from Julius Caesar. Now, Julius Caesar coming now to Egypt, he's already, he already declared himself as the dictator of Rome which means that he also now declared himself the protector and the guardians of the two Egyptians on the throne. So he is now marching to, he's now marching to Egypt to conquer and to subdue the last of the Alexandrian strongholds, which is the Ptolemaic Empire. The Seleucid Empire is already following. The last one is the Ptolemaic Empire. And so Julius Caesar is marching to the Ptolemaic Empire. When he arrives there, he has but a small force, about 800 horsemen to the 200 foot soldiers. He doesn't have a large army because he is coming there under the context that he is dictator and that be, being the self-proclaimed guardian, he now has the right to adjudicate in their affairs. But when he comes to Egypt, he does not meet a welcome wagon. In fact, they resist his approach. And that resistance was met, came with quite, with quite a great force. So that Ptolemy and Cleopatra decided they're going to add initially especially where Cleopatra is concerned, they wanted to resist Julius Caesar. But here the problem, both Ptolemy and Cleopatra had problems with each other. So the brother and sister could not agree on the throne. They could not agree. And what eventually happened is that Ptolemy had sidelined his sister, Cleopatra, and he decided to be the sole ruler so that it was really him that had intended to resist Julius Caesar and his approach so that he not only enlisted his forces, but also the Egyptians, they also enlisted. And they did put up a very good defense to Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar, no, the, what they did also is that they tried to destroy his fleet, which would have been a big blow to Julius Caesar. But for him, luckily for him, he was able to burn their fleet and destroy their fleet. Now, when he started to burn their ships, it drifted into the key. That's where the ships, the ships, sorry, made both. 
And that court, a lot of the buildings there on fire. And close to there was the most famous Alexandrian library with over 400,000 documents. That was also burned flat to the ground. But still, Longest to a guy, right? The upright ones is led by a guy known as Antipater. Now, Antipater is known as the Idumean Idumi king. That was a Jewish, that was a Jewish province. He led 3,000 Jews to secure the passage for Julius Caesar's army to get to him. Now, Antipater's son is the one we know as Herod the Great. So we see how Herod was able to become a king in the Roman Empire because of what his father did. Antipater led 3,000 Jews to hold, to clear a path so that Julius Caesar's army could advance to him without any opposition. If they did not do that, the outcome would have been different. It was because of the 3,000 Jews clearing that part made it possible for Julius Caesar to at last take control of um, to take control of Egypt and the Ptolemaic Empire. Now, while Julius Caesar is there, he is now called to settle a squabble between the brother and the sister. So it is decided that he will listen to the debate of both of them. Now, Cleopatra, and of course, I, I know we would have all heard about Cleopatra. Hollywood has has immortalized as being the most beautiful woman on earth. But Cleopatra was indeed a beautiful, very attractive woman. And she had a plan. History says, and I say history says, that she got herself wrapped in cloth and tied with a bow. And she was transported in the cloth and was brought to Julius Caesar's dwelling place. And she was placed at his feet. Uh, all this time, Julius Caesar doesn't know what is in the bundle. She wrapped herself in all this cloth, tied it with a bow, and she got her supporters to bring her and, and, and place her at Julius Caesar's feet. Well, Julius Caesar, seeing the gift, begins, begins sorry, to unwrap his gift. And lo and behold, he is mesmerized as his gift is animated. And when he beholds his gift, no doubt, brethren, we know she didn't just for church on Sabbath morning. No doubt, when his eyes behold, he was intoxicated by her beauty. And so he delayed his stay in Egypt because of her. And he was said by the historians to be carousing with her spending nights with her, eventually they had a child together. So Caesar was enchanted by her. But as the Bible rightfully said, she shall not stand by his side. We know from history that she eventually became the lover and mistress of Mark Antony. Now, who was Mark Antony? Anybody remembers? Anybody remembers who was Mark Antony? Sorry, kind of soft. Sorry, very soft, very, very soft. 
one of Julius Caesar's associates? Yes, yes, he was. Julius Caesar, in chasing Pompey to Egypt, left Mark Antony in charge of Roman Italy while he was on his way to subdue Pompey. So we see how corrupted and how intriguing this whole thing turned out to be because Mark Antony should have been an ally of Julius Caesar, but he then became an enemy of Julius Caesar. Not only that, Mark Antony the, 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 took away from Caesar his love and affection. And we know that Cleopatra, she, well, through her, her, the, her, her, through her, uh, what would you, you would call it? Through her, her, um, her seduction of Julius Caesar. Of course, Julius Caesar would have weighed in her favor that she should control the Egyptian, um, the Egyptian empire or the Egyptian. Um, what's that? Would just slip me the, the Egyptian territory, the Ptolemaic Empire. Sorry. Sorry for that, dear. She would, so naturally, because she seduced Julius Caesar, he swayed in her favor. And so she gained rulership and control of the Egyptian or the Ptolemaic Empire. Now, of course, although she did gain uh, rulership, remember, Julius Caesar is the guardian and the overseer still. Of course, she succeeded her brother she was the one and not her brother who ended up being more influential in the seat of rulership but cleopatra proved to be quite treacherous because she joined with mark antony to turn against julius caesar All right so that is something we will we will talk about a little more you know, we'll, we'll develop on that a little more. But I just wanted, I, I hope that we could kind of trace how verse 16 jumps into 17. So verse 16 ends by telling us that Pompey conquered the glorious land, which is Judea, Jerusalem. Verse 17 starts off by saying that Julius Caesar is invading Egypt. So I hope... Um, what we were able to look at shows how the, the biblical text, the little pieces in between, uh, we could connect the dots. So we see how Pompey lost his life and how Julius Caesar rose into prominence. So I don't know if, if there was anything confusing, if anything you didn't understand, I will go it over because I know it may have been a lot because there's a lot of history, brethren, a lot of history. I will even go over it a little bit more. I wouldn't go further, especially as we don't have any, we don't have any visual aid this evening. I'm not going to push it any further, but I'm just going to recap briefly. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask it. So just recapping, we have verse 16, which talks about Rome doing a according to her own will, and the general leading that charge was Pompey. And we know that Pompey conquered all of Europe and then Asia Minor, and he's coming down South Syria, Serenia, all the way Jordan, Israel, Palestine. He's coming down that way. And he also conquers Judea and Jerusalem. Verse 16 stops there abruptly and then starts also abruptly that where Julius Caesar is invading Egypt. So we don't know what happened to Pompey and how did Julius Caesar get into such a position? And that's what we were discussing. That's what I tried to share this evening. And just to recap, I started off by saying, and brethren, I have not covered all of the history in between. I try to keep it in line with where we're going with the study, but there's plenty more tons of history that you can feel free to research. So just to recap, what happened between Pompey occupying the glorious land and Julius Caesar invading Egypt. And we, we started off by talking about the civil breakdown in the Roman Republic. There were gangs being formed, there was civil unrest, and the Senate was powerless. We have two men secretly, they were not ordered by the, the Senate, coming together with the intention to subdue the civil unrest. That was Pompey and Crassus. Pompey, an able general, Crassus being the richest man at the time. Both of them 
realized that if this plan must work, they had to enlist the very up and coming Julius Caesar because of his popularity in the noble class, but also among the common people. So they decided to woo Julius Caesar into their unofficial conglomeration, which modern scholars call it the first triumvirate, because there was a second triumvirate, which we will talk about later, but this is the first triumvirate. So Julius Caesar agrees. So Pompey, Crassus, and Julius Caesar come together. But with this kind of power, they use it to serve their own personal ambition. And the Senate now becomes a figurehead so that they do what they want and get the Senate to approve it. But the man who, who benefits from this triumvirate the most is Julius Caesar. Because, because of this, he now rises to become a consul, which means that he is allowed an army and he will fight wars on behalf of Rome. So he, he moves into a very prominent position. Not only that, because of his military prowess, he grows in reputation, in experience, and his army is also growing and enlarging. And when and what happened was because the triumph, the triumvirate naturally, they will not, they, when they form, it was not formed with the intention to obey the Senate. It was formed to push their own agenda. He naturally pushed his own agenda. And what he did is he fought wars that was not approved by the Senate. Now, what that did for Julius Caesar was it allowed him to collect the spoils of war, which was money and wealth. And some of the territories that he was able to conquer were the Gauls, which is France, Belgium, which is today, he also invaded Britain. And with these spoils, it enlarged him very much. And so he grew to be more powerful than the other two members of the triumvirate. At this point, the Senate believed that this man is becoming dangerous. So they ordered Julius Caesar to disband his army and to come to Rome. Julius Caesar refused and he marched on Rome with his army. An aggressive move, which he tried to pacify by saying he only came with his army because he was afraid of his life. He, was, he had feared for his life. However, the senators, Pompey Crassus, did not take this lightly. And so a civil war ensued in which Pompey and Julius Caesar went to war. Pompey outnumbered Julius Caesar, but Julius Caesar defeated, he crushed Pompey's army. And as soon as he crushed Pompey's army, Pompey fled, going down to Egypt, while Julius Caesar made his way to Rome because they fought in Greece. Julius Caesar made his way to Rome. When he reached in Rome, he declared himself the perpetual dictator. Declaring himself the perpetual dictator signaled the form of Rome as a republic. And Rome would soon become the Roman Empire. So the onset of the Roman Empire began with Julius Caesar. So that now it was not the Senate ruling the republic, but it was one man who had absolute power. And it was Julius Caesar who had set this on foot. Julius Caesar then decided that Pompey had to be put in check because he was a very formidable opponent. And if he must consolidate his power, he must subdue Pompey. So he left Mark Antony in charge of Roman Italy and he went down to Egypt for Pompey. Unfortunately for Pompey, who was the guardian of the two young Egyptians on the throne, the brother killed murdered in a plot murdered Pompey. It was a betrayal. And so Pompey died seeking asylum in Egypt. Of course, by the time Julius Caesar arrived, he met opposition, which he decided to quell. Of course, he needed, he did not come prepared for a full-on engagement and he had to call for reinforcements. Antipater, an Idumean king, with 3,000 Jews cleared the path for this army to come through. And so the army came through unhindered to render assistance to Julius Caesar and he subdued Egypt, which was the last Alexandrian stronghold left to fall. He subdued that kingdom. He could not have done it if the 
3,000 Jews had not cleared the path for his men to come to his aid. While he is there, he declares himself guardians as Pompey is murdered. He declares himself, because remember, he doesn't need the Senate approval. He is already dictator. And he self-declares himself guardian and protectorate of the, the two Egyptians, Omnichon, Ptolemy, and Cleopatra. He weighs in to hear their dispute because the brother has sidelined the sister. There's a squabble between them for power, and he decides to listen to hear them out, and he will decide. Cleopatra use her womanly charm, and she seduces Caesar, who falls with hook, line, and sinker. Of course, he is influenced by her, and his power sways in her favor. And because of their fraternizing, eventually, they have a child together. But Cleopatra betrays Caesar. She doesn't stand by his side. And she actually positions herself with one who would become his enemy later on and fight against the Roman Empire. So we have Caesar here. We have Julius Caesar conquering and bringing an end to the Alexandrian Empire in totality. So there is no independent state or no independent entity representing the Alexandrian Empire. All of Alexander's empire now has been conquered by Rome. And Julius Caesar has now risen as the sole, the only, the single ruler of the Roman Republic. But as I said, when that happened, the Republic was destroyed and the rise of the empire was on foot. Because, because Rome once again would change, um, would change their, their government structure, so to speak, or their style of leadership. Remember, they went from a monarchy with seven kings. The seven king, terrible. Rome said, we don't want any king anymore. They then went to the consuls and the senate, which we looked at. And now we have a dictator who has taken over sole rulership. So no longer is it a republic for the people, but it's an empire. It's, it's an empire is emerging. It has not fully emerged as yet, but the Roman empire is now rising while the republic is now falling apart. And Julius Caesar is the one that is giving birth now to the Roman empire. And so we could now trace between 16 and 17, how we went from Pompey his death, how Julius Caesar ended up in Egypt and what he was doing there. Now, some historians say that the battle he waged in Egypt and his length of time in Egypt was simply because of Cleopatra. That is what some of the historians say. Of course, that, that, is, that is their recorded history. Um, so whether or not it's important or not, the point is that Julius Caesar was the one who brought an end to the Alexandrian Empire, where he erased the last stronghold, which was Egypt. So we have, so with that in mind, we will now look at verse 17 again, because we should have a little more understanding with verse 17. He, Julius Caesar, shall set his face to enter against the kingdom of Alexander's, uh, against the strength of Alexander's kingdom or the Ptolemaic kingdom, and upright ones with him, the Jews that cleared the path for his army to come. Thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of woman. So the Ptolemaic kingdom, the Ptolemaic empire, the Alexandrian empire, will give him a woman. Figuratively speaking, it was Cleopatra. And it, she seduced him. And of course, we know what went on after that. Eventually, they had a child together. But when we follow the verse, it said, she shall not stand on his side neither be for him. So she actually betrayed him. And we're going to look in depth at the betrayal and how that affected the whole turn of events that would have led going forward. The whole turn of events. So, so it is interesting as to how things would have happened. No, we will not go into this verse, but seeing the history, I would like you all to think about this. 
After this, he shall turn his face unto the isles and shall take many, but a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. Then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. This is Julius Caesar's. These two verses give us an insight to the fall of Julius Caesar. And for those who would have done the play, I know that some, some of us in school, we have to do Shakespeare, we have to do, and I guess Julius Caesar was one of them. We know, some of us may already know how Julius Caesar died. The Bible here has given us the historical evidence of how Julius Caesar died. So we look at those two verses when we come again, verses 18 and verses 19. It shows the fall of Julius Caesar. And after Julius Caesar, it shows the, another who is going to take his place. That's verse 20. But we're going to deal with 18, 19. And if we have time next week, we're going to look at 20. So I'm going to stop here for now. I think I would have said a mouthful. Any questions that you all have? Anybody have any comments? Anything that was not clear? Anything you would like me to repeat or go over? Anything that may have bothered you a little bit or something was not too clear? I'll be quite happy to go over. Yes, you said um, Mark Anthony was mm. um, remaining. Good evening, each... everyone. I'm not sure if I missed That's not, hold on, um, sister, something. Hold on, sister Stephanie. Yeah, but um, yes, sister Stephanie, hold on one second, right? I love um, Rome emerging. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, one second, sister Stephanie. Stephanie hold somebody... a minute. Yeah, hold a minute, sister Stephanie. Sorry? Hold a minute, hold sister a minute. Stephanie. Somebody have... else was yes. talking. Yes, yes. Yes, um, okay. you said, okay, no you said um, Caesar leave, um, leave Mark Antony in, in Rome. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then they was in Egypt. How Mark Antony get to Egypt to have? Right. So, so that in the next two verses, Cleopatra, and how that all turned out in the end. So we're going to deal with that in verses 18 and 19. Oh. We're going to definitely look at that. And we ha we'll have, an, an, and we will also see the rise of the second triumvirate, which is very critical to how things unfold. So Mark Anthony will, 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 for now, Mark Anthony is kind of in the background, but he will rise to prominence and we will discuss how he came to be in the company of Cleopatra and right. what happened. So we will yeah. definitely cover that. Definitely okay. cover that. Yeah. He is an important figure in the whole um, unfolding of the historical content contained in Daniel chapter 11. So he has a pivotal role to play. Okay, thank in you. Fact, in fact, in fact, I, I, I don't want to jump ahead, but in fact, it. Anyway, let me do jump ahead. Let me do jump ahead. It, 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 it would be very interesting to see how things work out. All right? How Mark Anthony and Cleopatra work out. All right? Okay. So, Sister Stephanie, so thanks for the, the question. Sister Stephanie, go ahead. Okay. Oh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'm not sure if I missed it, but how could. Pompey, Pompey just was kicked out of the whole general thing in verse right. 16, but he, that he didn't represent dead. Right. So what happened to Pompey was this, and I, I'll, I'll just go through it. There's not a problem, Sister Stephanie. So what happened was this. There was a triumvirate that was created. No, there were Pompey. There, there was a civil unrest within the Roman Republic, and they had a lot of civil violence, political violence, and the Senate seemed to be powerless to, to control it. So two men initially had the idea, which was Pompey, who was a general, who was the consul and general, and Crassus, which was the richest man at the time. So they decided, here it is, we could control the civil disorder. 
but of course they had a secret agenda. Now, this alliance is secret. The Senate doesn't know anything about this. The Senate didn't sanction this. They are doing this behind closed doors. But these two men realize that there's, a, there's, a, there's one who is very popular. He's growing in influence. And if they must be successful, he must be part of their plan. That is Julius Caesar. So he decide, So they decide to incorporate Julius Caesar and they, make, they, they form an alliance among themselves. Modern historians call it the first triumvirate, three of them. So it's Pompey, Caesar, and Crassus. So just jumping ahead, in all three of them, Julius Caesar emerges as the most powerful and wealthy. The other two, especially Pompey, realizes that that is a dangerous thing. So the Senate, at one point in time, tells Julius Caesar to disband his army and come to Rome, which Pompey would support because Pompey believes Julius Caesar to be too powerful. And for a single man to wield that kind of power, he finds that is a mistake. So he's in support of that instruction by the okay. Senate. Julius Caesar decides to rebel and he refuses to disband the army and marches on Rome, which is an aggressive move. Of course, he makes the excuse that there are those in Rome who want to kill him, and his army is just for his protection. Pompey didn't buy that. The Senate didn't buy that. Put two and two together, a civil war broke out. That civil war between Pompey and Julius mm -hmm. Caesar went on. They, they fought in Greece, where Julius Caesar, although outnumbered, he, he trumped Pompey's army. And so Pompey had to flee to Egypt. As soon as that battle was finished, Julius Caesar did not immediately chase Pompey. He rushed to Rome and proclaimed himself as perpetual dictator, which meant that he now had sole and total mm, control yes, yes. of the Roman Republic and the Senate. Now, when he did that, it was the demise of Rome as a republic, as an empire. After he raced the room and he took absolute control, he left Mark Antony in Roman Egypt in charge, and he then decided, I'll have to deal with Pompey. And so he headed down to Egypt to deal with Pompey. However, Pompey was betrayed by those whom he was supposed to protect because Pompey was, the, the two Egyptians on the throne were young, and the Roman Senate placed Pompey as their protector and guardian, ally in Egypt. So racing to Egypt, where he could reorganize himself because he knew Julius Caesar would be coming, he stumbled and fell in Egypt. He was betrayed and murdered in Egypt. And so he, he was not able to, to form his plans to repel Julius Caesar. Of course, Julius Caesar is coming to Egypt. And of course, we know what happened. Egyptians tried to resist. They can't resist Julius Caesar. It first seems like he's going to be overcome because he first comes with a small contingency. But his backup arrives in time through the help of the 3,000 Jews. He's able to thwart the Egyptian defense. And he also has, he also then engaged in a love affair with Cleopatra that turned out to be treacherous in the end because she did not stay loyal to him. And we will look at that later on. So that's how, so that's how Pompey kind of went off of the scene quickly in a nutshell, how he died and how Julius Caesar rose into prominence. And so we know at the point where Julius Caesar is okay. the man. All right. So, so you get it there, Sister Stephanie? Yeah. Right. yeah so, so it's all about power. It's all about power. Now, brethren, you see how quickly power change hand. Now, while I'm, saying, while I'm saying quickly, what I just described to you, brethren, didn't happen in six months. Now, we're talking about years, you know. We're talking about years, Barry. We're not talking about five years now. We're talking about 20, 30 years, even more going down, you know. We're talking about years. So we just talk about it in a nutshell here, but the kind of history, it spans a very long time. Because there's much more that could be said about Julius Caesar and his rise. There's a lot more that could be said about Pompey and his demise as well. But we just kind of stayed, we want to walk the line so that we don't get too distracted by the wealth of information that there is on these two very popular and prominent men. 
who are revered by historians. So no doubt historians would, would write a lot about these two men, right? So we are at the point now where Julius Caesar is the man. He is the one sitting as the head of the crumbling Roman Republic, soon to emerge as the Roman Empire. He's the absolute ruler and the perpetual dictator. Right? That's a Just, lot of history in one chapter. Well, yes. Wow. One yeah. Book. <laughs> there are two verses. Wow. There are actually one verse. Now, what happened to Sister Stephanie was that verse 16 ended abruptly and verse 17 also ended abruptly. So we had to connect the two verses together. How did we move from Pompey entering Jerusalem? Hmm. And then we see okay. in verse 17, Julius Caesar marching to Egypt. So we had to connect how did they move from there to there? Because in verse 16, Pompey is the general. But in verse 17, the main general is now Julius <laughs> Caesar. What happened to Pompey? So, you know, we looked at how that transition took place and how Julius Caesar now came into power. And from verse 18 mm. and 19, we'll see wow. now how that pans out because it talks about the demise of Julius Caesar. So we'll see how that happens over the next two verses. And we come into a very interesting verse. Very, I'm very excited. You see verse 20? I'm very excited about verse 20. So can't wait to reach verse 20. This one to me seals the deal. It is so profound. Brethren, when you see verse 20, you will, you, if you had any doubts, I know, I'm not saying that you had doubts, but if anybody had doubts on the authenticity of God's word, verse 20 will blow it straight out of the water, brethren. Verse 20 is spot on brethren i'm excited about verse 20 verse 20 is spot on so so uh, thanks for the question sister stephanie i was more than happy to to clear it up thank you sister Irma, for your question also and those who would have asked questions thanks anybody again. else have any question feel free or comments at this time All right, so brethren, what I would want to say in closing in this, and even though we're going through the history, I always want us to keep our minds focused on why we study in this. Why did Daniel allow, why did Gabriel, why in fact, Gabriel could only reveal to Daniel what God gave him to reveal to Daniel. So why would God allow Daniel to get all of this and in turn us? Well, brethren, here's the thing. When we look at humanity, we see one thread running straight through humanity, brethren. We see a singleness of purpose from one generation to the other. We see the godlessness of men, the, the surge for power, the grasp of power, and how inhumane and callous these men are. And we see how one man arrives today, he falls tomorrow. We see everything unveiled before eyes. And that tells me two things. One, there is a power at work underneath all of this, trying to establish, establish itself. And two, it tells me there is a power above all of this, keeping things in control. Brethren, we getting that? I don't know if you've seen that. There is a power trying to establish itself to engulf all of humanity. While there is a power unseen keeping everything in check. Because every time one of these men, they raise up themselves to take the world by storm and rule it according to their own will, they stumble and fall. Because if these men, if we look at the, the, the type of men that they were, if they were allowed to mold the world into their fashion, this place would have been terrible a long time ago. It would have yes. been a hundred times worse than it is now. But we know that God, God is allowing these things to unfold simply because when God is to judge men, they, he must give men the opportunity to display their true character 
not only that satan who is the power underneath stirring up these men he must also display his true character when judgment is pronounced nobody could say that god was unfair but why god is allowing these things he he must keep it under control because remember his purpose is for the salvation of mankind so even while satan is allowed to do his work god is making room still for those who want the gospel to hear the gospel so that what that says to me today joe biden is no different from julius caesar or pompey putin putin is no different than julius caesar back in the day or boris johnson or merkel or marconi very when we look at these men and we look at men in times gone by, we say the same MO, we say the same type of operation, the same mindset. We see it over and over. And these men live centuries apart, but if there's an underlying thread, there is a, there is a power that is perpetuating that type of leadership and that type of character. And that is Satan. He is the one perpetuating it. So even though men are centuries apart, they exhibit the same the same qualities. Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar never meet face to face, but they had the same attitude towards God. Why? And this is where we must understand there's a foe that is relentless. History has shown us that he is ruthless. We are no match for him, but there is one that is more powerful than him. And it is he who will keep us during these times. If you think it was pressure to live during the times of Julius Caesar and Pompey and every Monday morning, somebody with a sword knocking on your door. Why did those stay home and sleep? But no, they love war. So you in your little place, you're doing your thing, going about your business and somebody with nothing better to do show up on your doorstep with a sword and they say they're taking over. But people had to go through that more times. Think about how boundaries would have changed. Think about how countries would have expanded and then shrunk. When this one win, this one lose. That one win, this one lose. And think how much bloodshed it would have cost. But, but is that any different from what is happening today? Nope. The, the weaponry is different. The tactics may be different. The, the way in which it is done may be different, but the mentality is still the same. Men with power want absolute power. They always want more power. And the rich will always oppress the poor. That, has always, that is how Satan is. And the, and the minority possess the majority of the resources, and the majority has the most least of the resources. And Britain, if you look at war, that is what war does. War moves, war moves the resources from the many into the hands of the few. When Julius Caesar marched across all these territories and he conquered them, he took the spoils. So the wealth of these nations ended up in the hands of one man because he had an army that they could not fight. So that's how Rome amassed her wealth. So that the resources from the many came into the hands of the few. That is what war does, brethren. That is not changing today. When we look at this war between Putin and um, what is the, the um, Ukrainian president name? The, uh, oh gosh, his name slipped me. Um, his name slipped me, the president of Ukraine. When we look at this war, brethren. Zelensky. All right, thank you, sister Ines. The resources are moving from the plenty into the hands of the few. That's how it always was. That's how it always is. And that's what, how it always will be. That is what war does. So after this war is finished, whenever the agenda is completed, it will have a lot of people on the breadline, people trying to pick up their lives, people depending on somebody else for sustenance. Some people will die because they just do have and they just do have the ability to get anything and that's just what war does all the resources that these people would have acquired over time they would have lost it that's what that is war so when gabriel reveals to daniel he shows 
Gabriel, God is revealing to humanity what the human nature is and who is the father of those who do the injustice. Is, is to reveal to us to see where this world is going, where the earth is going. Brethren, we can't be taken by surprise. We just tracing through history. We seeing where the world is going. We could stand up next to Pompey by, by historical eyes and see what Pompey was looking at. We could see where Julius Caesar was looking at and where he had in. And we could see where every one of them in their time, what they were doing. And that tells us, brethren, that there's not a bright future coming down the road outside of Jesus Christ. The only bright future is in Jesus Christ, the stone kingdom that will destroy all the earthly kingdoms. That is the kingdom Amen. we're looking for, brethren. That is the kingdom that our eyes are on. So when we go through Daniel 11, brethren, we're supposed to be seeing through a lens where the world is going and where men want to lead the earth. Or the, or the people of the earth. And it also shows where we need to be standing. It also shows us that our faith needs to hold now. Because brethren, we see in what happened and it will happen again. As Solomon said, there is nothing new under the sun. So I want to leave that with you all. As we go through the history, it's a lens for us to see where the world is going. But to also take courage that God is in control. He never let God never allow one man to dictate for as long as he want everything as long as he wanted. God kept everything in check and God steered it. Even though he allowed them to run, he is still in control. So even though we see all these things happening around us, fear not. Be of good courage. God is still in control. So I turn you all over to Sister Ines. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Amen. Wade. I, I am on the road still, so I have stopped so that we could close off before mm -hmm. I drive off again. So I'd like a volunteer to pray for us to close, please. Holy Father, thank you for another session. Thank you for bringing each one of us here safely today, Lord. Father, we have learned so many things today. It is so much to even um, take in. But Lord, you said you're not going to give us more than we can bear. So Father, help us to uh, take this understanding. The history is important. It tells us where we are and what happened in the past is exactly what is going to happen in the future and now. So, Lord, help us to take everything seriously and what we have learned, help us to share with others. Be with Brother Wade and his family, Lord, help Sister Ines to reach home safely, be with her family also, and be with everyone on this platform tonight, this evening, be with their families also. Thank you again for all you have done, is doing, and will be doing for each one of us. And may we all have a restful night. This is my friend, Jesus' his precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Amen. Sister Stephanie. Okay, so... But amen amen i thank all of you for coming on and i pray amen. you have a good night and a good week ahead amen. so until next week please god sometime yes, later this week, week, week i'll send the recording okay great amen thank you amen have a blessed night everyone and have a blessed week ahead same to you, you brother